Okay, recap. Yeah. My name's Mark Cooper. Um, been searching all kinds of technologies that are alternative <laughs> for uh, about 12, year, 12 years now. Um, I've always been interested in the Tesla based things and whatnot. And uh, read about the fumes and all that and thought, you know, oh, I don't know if I'll ever get around to doing that. Because I didn't know how difficult it was or easy or what have you. Um, so. What a mess, Mark! Nothing. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 04, 05, I started really getting heavy into a lot of um, various technologies and reading a ton of material. Uh, I don't know how I did so much in a day, but so. Uh, so, fumes. All right, let me start from there. <laughs> I got too many different things in my head that I want to cover, but I'm only going to talk about fumes in this segment because um, otherwise we'll be off from all the So about fumes. So for things that I've actually produced, that started December 2012. I did a patent search and found 964 different patents uh, going over. 100 years. So the oldest patents I found was from 1912. Um, that guy was doing 205 miles per gallon on a Mike T or A, I forget which one. Um, and, you know, it was a very simple bubbler type thing, actually, is how it was designed. I uh, studied that a lot, that particular uh, patent. There's probably about four different patents that I've looked at um, in a lot of detail. And to see what's similar about them, what's what's the common thing, right? Because I'm not doing anything new. I mean, geez, 1912. <laughs> um, so the thing that you find in common with all the ones that definitely exceed 100 miles per gallon, they all warm the fuel. Uh, they keep keep it dry. Uh, it's straight into the intake. There isn't like a long path, and you know, uh, the stuff Tom Ogle did in 78 time frame. Um, he, he actually ran fumes from the gas tank at the back of the car to the front. Okay, well, we're talking about air moving in a vacuum. That's 1,100 feet per second sea level. A few feet from the length of the car, that's no distance. So, uh, and you can actually read through his uh, diary, if you will, you know, how it went. You know, he started doing one thing, and then he realized, oh, yeah, this is gasoline, so it's a solvent. You know, it's sitting in a vacuum. It wants to freeze. I've got to add heat to it. Um, you know, it gets really efficient, and he starts opening the throttle more, and now he's like collapsing the gas tank. Uh, because there's all these, uh, without getting into too much math, there's all these uh, flows and orifice sizes based on the stream's direction all the way down to where the valve is opening to pull it into the cylinder. Um, so there's a lot of math to know about this stuff. And this guy was just kind of working with what he had in his hands and figuring it out as he went. Um, and then, uh, directly following reading all these patents and reading Tom Ogle's work and whatnot, uh, I went out on YouTube. Okay, let's see who's got stuff out there. Everything under the sun's out there by 2012. Let's see if there's any 100 MPG type stuff. So I went out there looking, and I came across this guy on YouTube. His name was uh, Sunny Five Rising, and it was the I don't know if I'd call it inspirational, but it was the, it was the video that I watched where I seen how simple this was. Uh, I thought you got to be kidding me. It can't be that easy. You know, really? So I'm looking at this thing. The guy's got um, the carburetor off of his little Briggs & Stratton motor, little single-cylinder motor, you know, ran his air compressor, had his air compressor tore down, he was cleaning it up, putting fresh paint on it, going through the air compressor, and he's like, well, I've got this part, I thought I'd try this fumes thing out, see how it goes. So he has a little one-inch T, a couple half-inch bushings, half-inch lines coming off, two ball valves, One's going to the fumes on the gas can, one's going straight out to the air. Oh, really? So I'm looking at his gas can, and he's got a hole drilled in it, he's got another half inch line where it goes inside of the tank, there's only about an inch and a half of fuel in the bottom of the tank, and he's just breaking the level of the fuel, so as air's being sucked into the tank, it's bubbling the fuel and agitating it, and helping the fumes keep coming, and the whole tank stayed warm. I was like, that's it? So yeah. And I already knew about the gate stuff, I'd read about that, you know, and whatnot, so... I went from a Sunday afternoon, 1 p.m. on Sunday afternoon, watching Sunny Five Rising's video, ran over to the Heat website, used it as a parts list. I pretended I had nothing. I got all kinds of little pieces, parts, I think, or what all this stuff. 
uh, pretended as if I had none of that stuff at home. What do you got to do to go build this? Went to the Geek site, pulled the list down for the single cylinder, one inch intake that's good up to 20 horse. Okay. Used that as a parts list, went to Lowe's. $82 in parts, back to the house. It was the T, close nipple, half introducers, hose, a couple of ball valves, hose bar, hooked it all up, plumbed it all up, got an old generator out, I haven't fired it in six years, been sitting around, you know, the things all gunked up on the liquid fuel side because I didn't drain the bowls in it. So, I fired that thing up, uh, second pull, <laughs> I hadn't run in six years. And I had no idea about, you know, air fuel mixture. I just choked it off like a normal motor would be that's carbureted. You know, it's going to um, be a little more rich. So I put a little more rich to the fume side. And yeah, the second pull, it finally pulled enough fumes up through the whole tubing and all the way up into the system. It fired up and started running. Now at this point, I had no carburetor on there at all. This is just sucking straight through a T, straight into the motor. There's no regulation. So this thing's running wide open as fast as the motor will go. And I'm so excited about it. I'll shoot a video. It's out there. Actually, I'll go ahead and skip ahead a little bit. Um, that's, that's one of the videos after I cleaned it up and got a little further along. So, um, I about burned the generator up because it's running wide open. These things need to be governed. You know, they're not meant to spin the armatures as fast as I was running. Um, but I basically took a piece of aluminum. That's that piece you can see there. Right at so I could screw close to the that's on the T. This line with the ball valves going down to the fuse. You can actually see the very tail of that. It's out to the air. Um, that's a blow-off valve. So in the event it does try to reignite and blow back through the tape, that would let off that pressure instead of blowing all the way back through the pan and blowing the fuel out. But yeah, it really is that simple. I put the governor back on so it can regulate itself on the carburetor. So the carburetor is just working like a butterfly valve for the demand. And in this particular video, um, I've got it here. Oh, well, let's actually show up on the screen now. Okay, cool. So, get out your reference here. Sorry, you get So, so, um, so down beneath the sawhorses here, there's a pair of uh, heaters, like a regular little sunbeam heater you might have in some space, you know, a bathroom or something. Call them when I fire an extra little 1500 watt heater. So there's a pair of 1500 watt heaters down here at the bottom, uh, one off of each leg off the generator. It's a 6 kW generator. It's running 3 kW of load. So I already know the specs on this thing from when I bought it new. Uh, it's a construction. You know, commercial quality generator. It's not like a residential unit. It's meant to be out on job sites. Um, and that thing says, uh, you know, we'll run 50% load, yeah, uh, 10 hours on 5 gallons of fuel. Yeah. And I've run enough fuel through it with my salvages in my area where I live, uh, powering my house. But I know those, those numbers are accurate. And everything I found online about burning fumes in a generator because the demand so high and the mixture has to stay so rich, they say you only get 50% better. And I verified that. But hey, I get to run 15 hours instead of 10 hours? I'm cool with that. That's cool. Um, the thing about the motors when you're going down the road, the difference being, you know, this, this uh, butterfly is really cracked up and it's got a lot of demand on it. And, you know, there's a lot of load. So I get uh, why the, why the thing only gets 50% better, uh, as opposed to, well, how is the fumes, how why is it so much better on a car versus a generator? Well, you know, once you're up to speed and you're rolling down the highway, you're going to need like 20, 22 horsepower uh, to maintain your speed, fighting the wind, going 60 with the cruise on. So the throttle plate on the motor in the car is really closed down. I mean, it's hardly cracked up compared to what this thing's got to So that's why the efficiencies look so different. So, so that, I was kind of describing the thing I did with the generator about how does this work exactly. So, I mean, that really is all the components that there are. You know, at a fuel can, it's one of these older fuel cans where it just had a nozzle step, you know, with a cap on the end. I mean, anymore, you got these ones with the valves inside of them, they're spring-loaded, and they're only meant to, like, try to put fuel in a car, 
you know, it's not so easy to do this kind of thing. So I mean, if you do have an older gas can around that has the plastic nozzle on it, all it did was just chop it off where it would fit the hose bar, you know, so it'd make a good seal. That was it. As far as doing a, you know, proof of concept or somebody want to do something easy, I've had people find this information out there on the website already, hundredmpgmotors.com. And I got a phone call from a guy in Florida, and he's like, hey, I just uh, switched my zero turn, he got like a 6,000 dollar motor. He's like, oh, I just flipped it over and run it on fumes, man, this is great, what can I do to my car? I'm like, I'm going to make it too easy, I'm going to start telling you to like, do the same thing you did on the motor on the car, blow your car and come up blaming me, you know? Um, so, so yeah, there's a lot of different safety things you take into effect, especially with the car that, that you don't worry too much about on the motor. Um, but yeah, this thing does scale. It does work, and I'm, I'm all about technologies at scale. Um, part of what I didn't say in my introduction, I build uh, Cisco systems uh, networks for a living. So data networks, voice networks, Wi-Fi, mainframe. Uh, I've done everything Cisco produces. Um, I'm my own consulting company, so you know I make stupid amounts of money telling people how to build networks. Um, so my hobby has been, you know, messing with uh, Tesla coil based things. Not these, not these high fire and things that we just seen. Um, I build stuff that's on this really small scale, very low voltage, but produces ridiculous outputs um, based on the same, you know, theories and whatnot. But I'm kind of trying to stick to fumes on this particular talk. So um, I picked up this kid car. Wow, um, 13, 14 years ago now. And I've been sitting on it forever. I've not had an opportunity to build a thing. Um, you know, if it wasn't a money issue or a time problem or, you know, not all the pieces are together yet, uh, which motor am I going to use in the car, and which transmission, and all this business. Um, so I kind of I went in it kind of the same way I, I do with business. Um, you know, I've got this project plan, everything's kind of prefigured, and all the math's been done. I know what I'm going to get when I get to the end of that thing. I'm not flying over the seat of my pants on uh, it's a huge investment. So, um, I picked this car up. I have gone through all those gyrations. Those things have happened. I have finally gotten to where I'm beginning to physically build the car. So, if you do go to 100mpgmotors.com and look, there's a blog tab across the different tabs for the pages there. That blog tab is tied to 100mpgmotors.blogspot.com, but it's already tied in, so you don't have to go to the other. Um, and in there, from this past February till now, is a real good timeline of all the progress that's been made on the car. I've been really able to leap and bound whenever I do get time to work on the car. Um, because either family life or um, coming to events or, you know, deploying networks for customers, what have you. Um, but the times I do get to work on the car, because I've had all that other time while I'm away, I think about these things and I picture how things go together before I ever put it together and I've built enough stuff. Uh, already over the years, I know how things go together. So uh, you can reason a lot of that stuff out in your head before you actually do it. So whenever I get there, uh, there's no time wasted. I'll, I'll jump ahead. I'll watch other guys building their cars. So I'm part of another forum where guys are building these same things. And I'll see the progress over a time period. And they'll spend a little bit of time like every evening or every weekend or whatnot. And they'll just see me leapfrog in like a week. And they're like, what in the hell just happened? Dude? How do you get all this stuff done? It's like, well, I didn't show up at the shop and go, what am I going to do today? I went out there and got busy because I already knew what I was going to do. You know, I knew where all the tools were, I knew where all the pieces were. If I had to frat something, cut it, weld it, whatever, I'd just knock it out. Um, so I, I treat everything kind of that way, right? With the fumes and whatnot. So let me get back to that. Uh, the generator was first, and me, as soon as I know the answer to something, I'll eat frog. I always have. You know, and then I got people saying, What? You got a V8 run on fumes. It's just sitting there on the ground, it's like nothing there. I'm like, Well, there's a battery, you know, so I can fire it and it's firing the coils. And there's the bubblers down there, and I'm holding the, the fumes line up to the intake so it can suck it in the motor. But yeah, I just said, Screw it, I'm going to run a V8, I'm going to put it in the car, I'm going to go down the road. They're like, Dude, I'm just going to you. What do you got? A generator and a V8. I'm like, Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, it's true. There's a lot of people I encountered, and they were like, yeah, whatever. There's no way. I'm like, well, you can come to the house, hit the starter button for me. I can't hold the tubes and hit the starter button at the top. So you can come crank it. You can look like that at all you want, you know. Um, and I've had people come over and watch it fire and run, and 
they're beside themselves. You know, especially if they've, been, if they've bought into this can't happen. You know, there's no such thing. Um, much, much like Stan's thing, right? You know, it's like uh, run a car on water, whatever it is. Um, so, so you're you're faced with that even with something like this. You know, when it's really simple. So I went back. Okay, nobody's going to buy this. I'll go to the to the <laughs> to the go kart. So I've got one of these go karts coming from Northern Tool. Um, I think it was like two grand when I got it. It's a 150 cc motor, uh, fun part, you know, full off-road suspension. That thing like push over two inch size trees, saplings, you know, I mean, you can just make a path where you want to go with this thing. It's ridiculous. Um, so we've got places out there where we can ride this thing around <coughs> near where we live. And you can see some strange hoses that aren't typical for that thing, right? So, so this is kind of uh, what this is my last stage of this thing, and it's been running like this for two years now. So anybody that wants to check out something that runs on fumes and go for a ride, I just put them in a buggy and I'm like, okay, go, check it out. Um, you can see on this thing where the fuel line comes down from the steel fuel tank. Uh, it's over here on this side into the fuel tank. It drops right down to the carburetor, and that line has got up there in the Carolinas where I live. It's just orange clay everywhere. You know, I don't know if you guys are Clemson. <laughs> folks, but, um, you know, that orange color is for a reason, because that's the color of everything up there. You know? um, so, so that uh, that orange clay, you know, dirt daubers have filled up the hole for the fuel line supposed to hook up, and the fuel line then actually goes back to the can, I'm like, okay, you, believe, you can tell this thing's never had fuel in it like in forever. Um, and then what they can see, as I've got a, a small short line right there, it's, it's super stubby, I extended it up and, and attached to this bar because they got to bouncing around too much, all that off-road riding. Um, but what that is right there, it's a little tiny air filter, and it's the one like what you would see on like a 350 Chevy V8 that people put on the valve cover for a breather. You know, so that's my air intake filter now. Um, and then there is fuel in the steel uh, fuel tank that belongs in it, and then the cap that screws on top, I just took one of those unibits, it's a big step bit, ran my drill through it, knocked it out big enough to put a hose bar in it, and ran the hose off of it, it's attached to a uh, ball valve right there, and it runs straight into a T, that same T that was on the generator. So um, I've got the airline that comes straight off the front. I passed it in between the front seats, so I can just hold my thumb over for a choke, crank the cart up. It gets warmed up. I let, let off so it gets more air, and I take off down the road. Um, that exhaust gas is blowing straight back onto this big baffle. There's some folded sheet metal right here. I attached, drilled a couple of holes, attached some zip ties to it, to the bottom of the tank, so it warms the tank. I got it so hot in the summer, it got so rich, it killed the motor. And I'm like, okay guys, for the non-believers of it, you can't make power. What if you get a motor so rich, you kill it, you got to give it more air. Do you think you're getting enough fuel? Yeah. Yeah, this thing makes stupid power. It almost picks the front end up, you know, like you need to bounce motor stuff. Um, so yeah, it's not got a problem making power. So, um, yeah. For folks that want to uh, exchange information and go for a ride in the car, you guys are welcome to come down. I always tell everybody, I don't care where they're from. You know, they'll be in the area, they're like, hey, um, so is the car running? Hell yeah, we'll drag it up and fire it up. I don't care. We'll go ride in it. Um, you know, if it's if it's cold out, um, we'll splash a little extra gas in it because the, the raw fuel, you know, is reacting to the ambient temperature. And that fresh fuel will let the motor run long enough that that heated side will warm it up to the point that it'll run just fine after that. So it doesn't matter even if it's cold out. Um, so these are th these are some of the things that I've done. Uh, there's another VA. That is a Pontiac Trans Am, 1978. So we can invent a car. 6.6 .6 liters. That's a lot of displacement. I had to take the cap off of the front of this 15 quart, this is like what you drain your oil into normally, right? Then cap it off, take it to the place, take the cap off, dump it in. So, um, I have these two half inch air lines on top, uh, a one inch line, uh, sucking out of the center of that, there's like an inch of fuel in there, there's like an inch of fuel over here, there's that yellow spout I was talking about with the hose barb on it, and then I was like, oh, how am I going to get these air lines, these fumes lines, you know, because I'm sucking air on both of these cans, so that's all the air it's getting. I'm mixing air and fumes together, so I'm not going to get a lot of RPM, but you don't need it in 400. It's a torque monster. It 
two grand, you're done. It'll go as fast as you want. Um, but how am I going to get this down to a carburetor? So I'm looking around, and I thought, well, I don't have one of these style, but I can run down like AutoZone or whatever, grab one of these little 10-inch air cleaners. So I go grab one of those. This was the old kick plate on the front of the house. <laughs> I had just gotten through replacing that. I'm like, oh, there's some sheet metal. So I just wrapped it in a band to fit that thing, drilled some holes, punched some rivets in it, got some electrical tape, taped over all the holes where that thing um, normally screws into your front door, um, taped up the cam lids, top and bottom, used the unibit again, punched holes big enough to pass those hoses into. Hey, got my son in the car, fired up, let's see if it'll run. And yeah, it fires right up, runs fine. So you might like set that on the top of the carburetor? Yeah. Yeah, and there's plenty of vacuum, so it sucks it down and everything makes a good seal. Now, this car hasn't run since, God, when was the last time I was driving it? 01, probably. Um, and the diaphragm and the fuel pump on the carburetor bust, and it leaks fuel, and it won't run. I've had this happen like four or five times over the course of having this car. This was my first car when I was 18. They moved around the family, I got it back. Um, so I had been driving in 01, and fired a couple of times, maybe um, like just pouring gas down the uh, carburetor to like move the car or something. Uh, but I had been driving it on the road like forever, right? So this is what is this? This is the summer of 2013, and and this you can barely see the corner of that uh, jug right there. So that jug is uh, for the coolant, and I can see there's coolant in it. Sweet. I don't open the cap and look down the radiator, but guess what? Somewhere this thing's leaked over time. I had no idea. I'm running this thing dry. I cooked this frickin' motor, having no idea, and that really, I was, because this was the car, right? I'm like, well, I've got a blower cam I can stick in it. So I go out and I get a blower cam for it, so I can shut the exhaust before I open the intake. The most important thing in fumes, you have to shut the exhaust before you open the intake. So, speaking about that for a second. These, the, the motors as we've seen them, and this is a 78 model, so it's definitely, you know, the most small ridden thing ever. Even though it's a 400, it only made 188 horse that year. It's terrible. That's how much small control crap they put on these things and detune them and whatnot. Um, but one of the worst things that they've done, uh, doing a bit of history on fumes, way back in the day, 1912, when this guy got his patent, one of the first things that happened right after that, within a year, I want to say, uh, the chemist had been involved at the oil company saying, can't be having this. And lead was getting added because all the fuel was unleaded before that happened. They added lead, it screwed up that guy's process, and then they felt a little sigh of relief. Um, of course, they figured out later with all the studies how bad lead was for everything in the environment that lives. And it was like, oh, so now we're back to unleaded only. But now they're doing the additives and screwing around. Nevertheless, you can do the heat thing, and I can explain that in a second because I have worked in oil refineries and petrochemical companies when I work construction, so I understand how that stuff works. Um, prior to that, before I started doing IT work. So, um, i trying to remember what I was going to do about the motor. So, so the blower cam. So, so if you got a turbo car or a blower car from the factory, there's stuff out there, right? Because they had these um, 3800 V6s. I'm going to pick on GM for a minute. They've had these 3800 V6 motors and tons of cars for a long span of years. It was a really solid motor. Uh, it was around during the Grand National Days um, in the 80s, and it went all the way through, wow, early 2000s before I think they finally dropped it um, for a 3900. But that 3800 exists out there with the supercharger on it from the factory. It also exists as normally aspirated. So for the folks that don't even want to bother with, you know, i got to get this cam and this motor, you can buy the blower motor version of the car, you know, of that motor, I mean, they're around, they're cheap. Um, you can get a regular version of that motor's intake and swap the intakes out. Now you got the blower cam and the motor, you've got one that you can throw the fumes to. Now you're going to look for how do I meter the fuel? How can I adjust for normal driving on this business? Um, and that's where I'm going next. So, um, so this is my last bullet point right here. I'm not been paying attention to time. We'll do the clock time works. Oh, we're good. Six. Okay. So, um, so, so the, the three typical methods that you find folks doing this stuff with PMs. One is the bubbler thing I was explaining, right? So uh, that that's what Frank's got over here. Um, 
you're, you're sucking air through a volume that has gasoline in it. Again, it's generating fumes off the top of that volume of fuel. Uh, you need to keep it uh, warm and agitated so it's constantly coming. Yeah, I mean, this, this, that, this is the, the simplest um, form of it, right? So he's got. So this copper tube, is this what you're warming it with? Uh, actually, it's the outer black area as well. Okay, so, you're, so he's warming the whole canister. Right? So he's warming the whole canister. And this is a similar, uh, from a design standpoint, this is very similar to what I'm going to do for uh, one of the computers. Yep. I apologize for the interruption. off the top. This is allowing air to come back in. It's got the tiny holes drilled into this line that runs inside there. Right. So so he's keeping the fuel warm, agitated. He's got air flow through the box, um, which is going to equate to this. So this this is good stuff to catch on to, right? As far as I understand this. I mean, look at the size of that hose compared to the size of that. So this is your restrictor for how many, how you know, it's a mechanical means of handling how much fuel is going to get demand wise. Through a system like this, so this is a variable. Um, the, the thing that the demand's on on the carburetor may be variable, but the limit that's going to stop it is going to be the size of that orifice right there. The cool thing is for motors, there's a website, and I've got all this stuff available on the web. Um, I'll pass out this as far as everybody that's interested in all this stuff and wants to read more about it, um, where we can share information. If you guys have information you want to post up and not deal with machines, I've got an open set cloud. That will spin up as many machines as we need. Um, <coughs> I think I can start up like 40 servers or something. So I got plenty of horsepower to start up whatever we're doing. Um, and enough disks to store probably everything you've ever done, maybe, that you want to see again on any of these topics. All right. Conversation, you know, you know, uh, Edward Snowden finally let everybody in on that, and that there is no such thing. Um, yeah, there is a way. It's very difficult uh, to to truly ensure that you have private conversation. There's there's another way that makes it a pain in the ass on them. Um, they can get it eventually, but I can talk about that. Later. Um, so so on a few things. So um, the orifice size. That's what I was getting to. So. For this size uh, airline to pass, how, how much uh, fumes and how much air can pass through that, there's a good um, equation available out there on the web. I've got links to it um, that lets you put in the number of cylinders, what's the bore and stroke, what's the RPM. It doesn't say fuel. I believe it has something about the horsepower. So between those different input variables, it will come back and tell you the orifice size you need, how big a pipe do you have to suck air and fuel through to allow this size motor to run this many RPM. So that's a handy piece of information to know. So once you know these things, you can go back and do all the math. Well, there's another spreadsheet out there that I had uh, found uh, from some Mustang guys that drag trace their cars all the time. They've got this thing where you can put in the tire size, your gear ratios and transmission, your rear gear, um, and it'll come back and say, oh, your motor's going to turn this many RPMs in this gear at this speed. Awesome. So now I can even calculate all the way down to my miles per gallon before I even crank the car. So I've done all this math already, and a simpleton version of doing the fumes, uh, which I haven't got to that third process yet, and that's what I'm going to start with, which is past simpleton, but it, it, it's better than the bubbler. Um, but it's not the, the best way that you can do just fumes, uh, gasoline on them. Um, in that math, it says I should get 160 miles per gallon, 130 to 160, depending on how lead-footed I am. Um, but uh, the things I've talked with Frank about since then 
And knowing that I'm not actually going to do that version, I am going to run the heated version of it. It should exceed 200. Um, and a lot of that information is going to be able to uh, be taken from that orifice size business, right? Because if I only need, let's say I allow it to give me 100 horse out of 300 horse it could possibly make. Um, I'm restricting it down so far that I'm mechanically holding it back from an air fuel ratio of so much um, you can't help but get good gas mileage because you're not sucking that much fuel because you're not allowing the demand. Um, now a word on fuel computers. As things have been since um, late 80s, early 90s, yeah, um, fuel computers have allowed a variance for control by the O2 sensor, saying if it's rich or it's lean, and the fuel injectors can pull back or they can dump more fuel. Um, and it's trying to maintain what they claim that car is supposed to get. Because it's interesting, right, how over the years you see different cars getting released at different times, and sometimes they have ridiculously good gas mileage, and we go through a period of 15, 20 years, and it's crap, and then all of a sudden it's really good again. And you see these laws coming out that say, well, you have to put out at least this million cars, of all the cars you're making, they have to be this much miles per gallon. And as they start forcing these things, then you see it start coming back the other way. Gas mileage starts getting better. It's like, okay, so what are they doing? Well, they are literally, and it's on C-SPAN, you can see it on YouTube before it's been recorded from C-SPAN, they literally work hand in hand together. The guys that are making the fuels and the guys that are making the motors are ensuring these things jive together. And they are behaving as engineers and expected. Um, for example, I had a 90 model Corvette ZR1 uh, for a period of time. That thing made 400 horse at the wheels and it got 29 miles to gallon down the highway. That, to me, that's like the new standard, you know? If you're going to have a high horse motor, you should get at least 29 then. But directly following that, the Corvette Sense, no such animal. Uh, they're just now coming back to like 28. And it's a completely different motor. So it's not like it's, they can't do it. Um, so, so what we're going to do um, about this, because the computer will allow a variance, but once you go too far out outside of the bands of what it's going to allow, its default method is to be to assume something's broken and it falls back to this backup mode they talk about, right? Where it only works off of a handful of sensors, it doesn't try to maximize economy anymore, and it's in what they call limp hold mode, so you can get it back to the dealership, check engine lights lit, you know, you got to go get it checked out and see what's going on. So it, it is a way to ensure that it does perform as designed, uh, but it's also making sure that you're not trying to drive it outside of that zone. Because folks that add HHO to the intake or they do things to um, drive better gas mileage, it eventually pushes the O2 sensor so far that the, and initially you get that 20 to 25% better gas mileage, but then they say, oh, and then it gets worse after that. And I started dumping even more hydrogen to it, and it got even worse. Well, yeah, because you blew beyond its window. It's allowing you 20 to 25%, but once you blow beyond that window, values are out of range. Computer's like, uh -uh. it goes into backup mode and starts dumping more fuel again. So, what do you do about that? Well, you lie to the computer. You get rid of the O2 sensor. You put in an O2 simulator. The O2 simulator tells the computer, O2's great, it's perfect, it's stoometric all the time. It doesn't matter what the RPM is, doesn't matter what all this is, you're on the money. You're firing exactly right. And all that's doing is making the fuel computer run off of its map which it has. It knows these inputs at these RPMs should pulse the fuel injector this amount. That's all it knows. So that's what it's doing. Um, as those variables change, you know, it adjusts the pulse, adjusts the pulse rate accordingly. So if we start lying to the computer and we start replacing it with other parts, so I don't want to run my fumes motor lean and burn the piston up. So what am I going to do replace the O2 sensor? Exhaust gas temperature. EGT will tell you if you're running lean or rich. It's in every piston engine aircraft I've ever seen. Works great. So in my second from the front and most rear cylinder, I'll have uh, EGTs in, and I can get an average overall of the length of the intake runner. And I can see uh, where the motor is temperature-wise. I know if it's rich or lean. And I bias that O2 simulator to let him tell the computer if he's rich or lean. And I switch off all the injectors. I have a, a couple of relays. It's going to switch them off into dummy loads. Because if the computer doesn't see the injectors, it says, shut off the fuel pump. I can't fire the injectors. So if you switch it into a dummy load, now it's... That's it. 
So, um, so, so I switched the, the computer's connections it was into the fuel injection in, injectors themselves into dummy loads so that it still thinks it's firing injectors. I listen to the number one injector and I use that pulse because that computer and that car and that motor were designed to run together at that pulse rate for the size motor, this displacement, this RPM. I don't have to work all that out. It's already in the car. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I am going to get an Arduino, a little hardware controller computer, and I'm going to have a Raspberry Pi, <coughs> another small Linux-based computer, and the Arduino is going to take a handful of inputs that is going to mirror what the car's computer sees. I want to see them too in the raw, and I'm not going to work through the data bus and pull them from the computer and all that business, because every car you go through, you're going to have to deal with the differences and whatnot. So, so the Arduino is going to learn the, from those same sensors the car does, um, and the Raspberry Pi is just going to be your display that's in the cockpit. In the <laughs> I'm flying all the time when I'm driving. So, <laughs> so uh, up front, though, I'm going to have a little touch screen in there. You know, it'll give me some of the numbers that I need to know about what's going on. My EGTs are going to be on the A pillar in the car, uh, right beside the windshield, the frame uh, by the door. So I'll have my temperatures there. I can see the computer's going to see those temperatures. He'll be driving the thing. Um, single injector instead of eight injectors, it's a V8. So you can kind of tell what the math is going to work out on that right away. So, so that's going to be what I'm going to call Fumes 1.0, right? Um, and I don't have this all drawn up uh, to show, but basically what it amounts to, um, those handful of sensors I'm going to read in parallel, um, switch injectors off. Excuse me. I'm going to have a chamber, but it's actually going to look more like a little box, kind of a section thing. And inside of it, it'll look kind of like a little oil cooler or a small radiator looking thing. It's all welded aluminum. Um, it's going to suck exhaust gas off, shirt off the exhaust. It's going to roll through this box, probably um, slightly cool at first. It's going to suck it through the box and back around to the intake. And I'm going to valve the uh, how much heat it's pulling through that box based on the fuel. That's one of the things on the touch screen you're going to tell it which kind of fuel did you put in the tank. Because this thing, now you run on fumes, you become multi fuel. You can mix all kinds of stuff and run. So uh, different fuels are going to have those different. Uh, temperature flash points, and you're going to not want that box to get too hot, pre-ignite the fuel before you can get it to the motor. So um, that's going to be a component. What? Sorry, go. You can use a, uh, a liquid intercooler? Yeah. It's already set to basically be exactly that. that yep. It's cold hot, and it's already got space. So a lot of people have them that come with temperature sensors on them, so they know exactly what kind of boost they're going to get. Right. That's, that's already if you know the cheap one, let me know. The last one I had was eleven hundred dollars, and I'm not spending that again on this. Yeah, not cheap. And he sells it for like two hundred bucks. So, so we're talking. <laughs> I mean, because that's literally part of the pathway, right? And and whenever I, and, and what, what's the end goal with this thing, you know, and all that? I'm giving away like, all the information. Yeah, I'm going to give it all away. Um, because I know not everybody's going to go out there and build their own. They're going to say, no, I want that dude to build mine. He had all this other stuff going and whatnot. So I'm not concerned about that. Um, that'll come. Uh, my concern is finding the folks that want to do it with me so that they can actually build it because I'm busy doing other crap. Um, so th this is a stepping stone for me. Th this is like low-hanging fruit. I'm like, yeah, this is simple. I can get on it right away. I can get it knocked out in a couple of years' time. Um, once I'm there and that kit's built, what's that kit going to be? I've got a guy that built wiring harnesses for cars. Um, he's actually very well known in sports car circles. He is the guy to go to if you want a Corvette motor put in your RX-7. Um, he's one of my buddies. So he builds wiring harness for interfacing completely foreign things to one another and they all plug and play. Everything works just like it was supposed to from the factory. All the gauges are good, the AC kicks on, it's supposed to do everything. So this isn't little Mickey Mouse weird, you know, hope it works um, stuff. Pins everything out, you know, same connectors that the guys use from the manufacturers. Um, so I've got that guy. Uh, two streets over, I've got a guy with a dyno. Uh, he wants to see a fumes car on a dyno pulling real power numbers. He doesn't buy into the pull make power. No problem. I get free dyno time out of you. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, dude. I'm on that. Um, there's a racetrack uh, about five miles this pro's fly from the, um, Dale Earnhardt and his son used to come down there uh, before NASCAR season every year and run their circle track car to get it ready uh, and dialed in. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things of networking with people, you know. I know these guys, they know somebody, they'll let me on the track. And the, the, the point being, build a kit, 
modify the kit where it works for that particular motor, that'll be the first motor I'll release it for. Hey, anybody want to go grab one of these out of the junkyard and throw this on it? There you go. Um, other motor releases will come later as we start doing that, you know, for V6s and inline fours and what have you. Um, I'm working with what I got. I got a V8. That's what I'm doing first. Um, so, well, Roflu, um, all the stuff we can do ahead of time to get the math as right as we can do it before we actually roll it out. Roll it out. Um, get it to the dyno. Tune things there. Make sure they behave as we expect. Go to the track. You know, set the thing on 60 mile an hour and just let it run for four hours or what have you. Consumption test. Gather all the data. All the stuff will be data logged. It's the point in having the Arduino on the Raspberry Pi. The Pi will be the interface for the car, but it's also Wi-Fi, and it'll talk to your laptop in the car and dump all the data that you can stand. Um, so, you know, for, for the people that need the verification or want to build their own and they want to see, oh, well, that's what this takes. You know, I can tweak mine this way. Thanks, dude. You know, um, we can move on. So, so that's what the kit's going to be about. Um, an electronics bundle, um, the two computers that are pre-programmed to do this work, um, the EGTs. It's going to be like basically a bundle of stuff with the vaporizer box that I'm not going to plumb the intake and the exhaust side to the particular motor that you're trying to do it to. And that I think, <laughs> I don't know, but I have heard of folks building kits that are very similar to other things that are already out there and they say, hey, you're, copy, you're infringing on this patent and what have you and that kind of deal, right? So, um, and I know it doesn't matter that I've got prior works before the particular patent came along, but after I whiteboarded this with multiple people and had drawings, it wasn't a year later there was a patent that looked exactly like my thing. So I'm like, bastards. Um, <laughs> that's tomorrow's talk, how that happens. Um, because I do know firsthand uh, about how those things happen. I've had clearances, I've built uh, secure networks um, for alphabet soup in military, and yeah, I know how those things happen. So, um, yeah, that's the majority of what I've got for the themes. Um, started one day, I've seen a video, ran out, grabbed a uh, list of hardware from the geek page, uh, ran the lows, got that stuff, came back, plugged it on the front of this generator, second pull, fired right up. Had multiple people come by and check it out, you know, I told some of my buddies, and they know I've looked into the stuff since, you know, early 2000s. Um, and, you know, it, it's kind of funny because for different people, it's, it's different stuff, you know, that does it for them where they go, ah, that's real. Um, and it's weird, right? Like, this one guy, it, I would treat him like a brother. And he came over, and I had uh, the generator out in the garage. It's cold out. I told him, you know, it might not start full first pull. It's cold, but we'll see what it does. First pull, it fired right up. And he's like, oh, that's it? I was like, well, yeah, what do you expect? Well, you'd have to tinker with this and tweak that and do this thing because, you know, we don't know exactly know how it works and maybe it doesn't always work. And I'm like, dude, you get in your car and you crank it and it fires right up, right? It's been engineered, hasn't it? <clears throat> it's the same thing. If you know the flows and the volumes, and I mean, it's math, dude. It works. Um, so so that was it for him. Uh, the guy down the road, lives down the road from me, he built all kinds of stuff. He's got a 57 model passenger bus. He's converted into an RV. Really nice. Teak wood and stainless steel inside. It's like a yacht. It's like, holy crap, dude. The guy works with his hands all the time. He comes down. He's built motors and stuff. Tinkers on dirt bikes. He had a Fiero. And I'm, this is a Fiero-based kit car. And so he wanted to come down and check it out. And I said, hey, if you see this motor, turn on fumes. And, you know, um, yeah, that's probably Nate there in that picture, cranking that one. But I had him come over and hit the starter for me, so I can hold this thing up there and we'll fire this thing up. He hits the starter and he's totally inspecting everywhere. He's looking for a way this thing should be running. And I specifically got these lines. They're clear with the fiber reinforcement. Just so people can see. You don't see any trailing liquid racing up through there. It's just dry fumes. Um, so they can see that, you know. And the guy watched it and he just shook his head and just he was in total denial the whole time. And for another 15 minutes after he's seen it happen, I mean, there's no water pump on the front of this thing. So I'm going to let it run in 30 seconds. i got to kill it. I'm not going to cook this motor, too. I was like, this lost the other motor. Um, so, so, you know, he's beside himself. He just didn't believe it. And then during the course of the conversation, I said, well, if you look at my web page, you know, the very first, the home page that he hit, it's got a little bit of a history lesson on there. It's got a couple of links where Smokey Unit did this in the 80s. And for anybody that's a race car buff and fan about NASCAR and whatnot, and Smokey Unit was amazing um, back in the day on uh, the things he did. He was one of those guys that was an engineer and a driver. 
You know, he wasn't one or the other. He was definitely both. And he won races. And uh, he came up with some pretty interesting cheats. Um, but once he seen how to do this, he did this to a Fiero back then. 84, I want to say it was. Um, and it was the Iron Duke four-cylinder. And he got 63 miles to the gallon and 0 to 60 in 5 seconds. Which was fast for a four speed that you had to shift and the synchros were crap. You couldn't shift fast, so it's not bad. Um, he had a 3.8 liter V6 that didn't have one of the heads on it with a big, huge flat piece of steel bolted down where the head belongs. And he balanced out the thing so it was only a three cylinder. And he had this weird way he would plumb up a turbo on these things to behave where the exhaust ran. It, it was not like you see a turbo normally plumbed. He would run it through, um, it would do some warming, he made it work like a reactor, he brought it back through the intake side to cool it enough before it went into the intake. It was strange. It's, it's on Hot Rod Magazine uh, websites, and the links are on my webpage, uh, so you go straight to those articles where they describe it, and they show the pictures and whatnot, what he was doing, but he did some interesting stuff with the turbos. Um, but now, we're getting back to the thing I was talking about, flows, or flow side. So, um, yeah, he traded miles per gallon for performance because he had a little boat. I can imagine what that four cylinder would have been if he would have knocked it down and stopped it from getting wicked performance and let it maximize the gas mileage. Good. To back up on the warming of the fuel, um, if you're in a cold climate, you know, snow, 32 or below, are you going to need some type of a Preheat it somehow or something? Or just crank it and then it'll so, warm itself? Yeah, I live in the south, so I mean the coldest, I mean we have ice down there and whatnot, but still it's nothing like living up north. So, um, I'm sure my initial stuff that I'm going to do is going to be spraying enough fuel. So, so design-wise, I knew I was going to wonder what would. Um, Thanks for trying to get you over. <laughs> No, I'm looking for Mark. 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 Yeah, the diesel was right up here earlier. Yeah, it's on the uh, other side of the door. Yeah, right in front of you, Frank. Awesome. Yeah, it's on the other side of the door. Yeah, I'll go back out. Looks the same as the one. Yes. So basically what I'm trying to draw is th this line is representing air running back into the intake on the motor. Um, this is coming off the exhaust so you can heat through that guy.
there's going to be my fuel injector. I'm going to spray fuel. It's going to be at the right distance. I'm going to have to like measure it out in the air so I can see the mist. Because I, I want it to want it to mist out as much as I can right as it's coming in contact with the plate. It's going to be messier as I go, so it's going to be part of what we're This is a cold start circuit. <coughs> no, this is like normal runoff. So yeah. it should be it should be wet enough um, on on cold start. Uh, like uh, the fuel injector will probably do like double time, like straight double what it normally would to enrich this guy enough that it'll crank. Um, because even when uh, you don't have a lot of uh, temperature to work with. You can do what the guys have been doing from the power factories for years. Just dump more fuel on it. <coughs> I mean, injecting, literally. If you're injecting fuel back in your fuel box, yeah, it's not here. Yeah, yeah, so the only injector that's going to work. I'm going to run off the same fuel pump, same fuel red. I'm going to use the same fuel pressure regulator. I'm just going to tee off of that line and run up here and run this other injector. Because I'm going to switch those injectors off by pulling the power away from So, um, and that's another thing. If you do screw around with this on an engine stand like I have, um, you got to go down through there and disconnect all the fuel injectors because if you dry fire those, they're not going to last long. <laughs> um, so my original thought uh, back when I was first doing this was, well, I'll I'll, I'll let the computer um, allow the injectors to fire normally, crank the motor, and then after it hits 100 degrees on the water jacket, then I'll switch the injectors off and let the fumes take over. But since then. I've seen enough off the single injector business that I'm like, yeah, it's good. Um, now, that's still an option, of course, that the computer could do an outside temperature. I, and I'm going to have outside air temperature to know um, because of having to do with when you lift throttle and you're going down the hill and you can some backfire and all that. Um, there's a lot of drivability stuff you have to learn about um, these things um, when you go down the road. But, you know, I've done a lot of reading. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, it, as long as it's warm enough, you should be able to fire the run injector. It'll crank like you know, there's no need to fire these first. Um, I could always have that be such. I wonder about this couple of the temperatures too. I don't know what it's going to be. But yeah, I'm sure there's a threshold. Definitely 20 degrees. I doubt that would work. Um, I'm thinking you fire the car normally, and then when the water jacket hits 100, then you turn on. Still take, yeah, but it'd have to run a minute and a half at least, so it's not going to happen if it lasts 10 30 seconds to die. So, I mean, that's not going to do it. Um, and the reason I said just don't want fuel, Volvo is one of the most common uh, cold start fuel injectors that all the performance guys like to grab because they'll run a normal car uh, fuel injection, they'll get the one from Volvo, and in theirs, they've got right behind your throttle plate where you push the gas, you know, and it opens up the throttle plate going into the motor. Right behind that, even though it's that normal fuel injection, right behind here, there's this like huge honk <laughs> fuel injector that just sprays students amounts of fuel on its cold start circuit. And people go and grab those so they can dump more fuel because they're stuffing more air, or, or you know, they're adding a turbo that doesn't belong in their motor originally or what have you. And instead of going out and getting bigger injectors, you know, and, and beefing everything up like they should, that's the cheap way of doing it. Go out there and get one of those and just toss them a ton, dump tons of fuel. Um, so I know I can get away with doing that kind of stuff for a cold start, but um, as the car sits right now, it's not a drivable chassis. The axles are getting produced right now, actually. Um, I just got those sent off with a week and a bit ago. Um, so before Christmas, I'll have axles for the car. And the reason all this is custom stuff, um, the motor is out of my 95 Trans Am whenever I had it. It made 530 horse at the wheels when that motor was in the car. It was under 12 pounds of boost. So the supercharger's out. In fact, normally aspirated, it's probably about 300 at the least. Um, but that's fine. I'll take 300 and turn the hospital down. Um, so, so that's the motor. The transmission is actually out of a G6, on the G6, because it's a six-speed manual. Um, and those axles that run from that are meant to turn hubs for a G6, not for an S10. So the front wheel drive part of an S10 4 Blazer, that's what my rear hubs are. Um, so now I've got to come up with a custom axle that has a G6 output that turns S10 hubs. Um, and then of course I want the axle to be strong and have a clear horse, so it's off the shelf. Um, so yeah, there's some things that are ridiculous.
which actually I think we can see in that picture. Yeah. Um, Where he's pressing his thumb on the, to crank it. Yeah, you can actually see it there. Valley parking, 
Yeah, screw that dude. You're not going to go around the corner and punching it and dumping the clutch and spinning the tires. No. These things are 335, 30, 18s. 13 inch tires off the back. They're expensive. No, you're not going to go turn on the tires. Uh, I've even considered, and I'm very much against all this RFID chicken people crap, but <laughs> if I get my own, I rip my own code in, yeah. I know what's on that bag. Um, I've considered that because you put an RFID reader in the door so nobody's paying attention when you're cranking it, that your hand happens to be next to the door, and then nobody's going to crank it unless I'm present. So, take my hand through. <laughs> I was going to ask, about how long, do you know how long like, people have been doing this for in terms of using vapor as a way of power an engine? Documented since uh, 1910. Wow. And 1910, there's actually a lot of electric cars on the roads in the cities. Um, del delivery trucks. It was rampant with the electric cars. But yeah, 1910 was the death of it. 1912, it was a joke. Electric Where, cars. What was the Who wants those old batteries? Yeah, if we work on battery since then, holy crap. What was the source for that? Where do, you remember, do you remember where you got that? Yeah, thing? well, through the patent search, you can see where the guy okay. uh, applied and uh, accepted in 12. You can see whenever his work was done and the patent was applied for. Do you know, you know the names on top of your head? Any um, if someone wanted to find it, that's what I'm Yeah, I would just say um, hit that under the and Perfect. Because it's got, what, awesome. it's, it's got links in it um, to some of the history. And I can always go in there and bump that up. Awesome, thank you. Um, in your research, have you ever come across the book, it's out of print now, but it's written by the Shell Oil Company called The Fuel Economy of the Gasoline Engine? Yeah, you know about the, uh, have you seen the video where the guy that worked for Shell was on his deathbed and he's talking about the gas knowledge that they were getting in their labs where they were swimming around in a permanent competition? Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like 73. They were using coolant. They were using hot coolant to boil the gas. Cool. 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 Um, yeah, they did a lot of things. Yeah, because you can actually, well, gas boils with, if you run 190 degrees coolant from the radiator and the, and the gas thing will boil at 145 degrees. Depending on the, the pressure. Uh-huh. I've done Correct. it. Yeah, I was going to say, because you can, so so if you look at the thing that, um, I just said his name earlier, race car guy, Smokey Hennig. Uh, if you look at the stuff he did, he was actually running his fuel between 400 and 440. Um, and the reason he was doing that, he was saying, so so it's all about the hydrocarbon chain. You know, how long is it? Right. right? So uh, if you got diesel and kerosene, and that's what I was going to talk about earlier. So I'm going to borrow this just for a second. Okay. This, this column, I mean, if that's a 200 foot column in a oil refinery plant, you got different takeoffs along the oh, column. Yeah, yeah and as the, as the temperature goes up the column, you're pulling off the different fuels. It's all the same stuff, but it's the hydrocarbon chain. So what are you doing with it by heating it up? We're, reproducing that factory again, and we're saying, no, we want the hydrocarbon chain to be this. We want them all this size, because we're rolling through this temperature. So if I have differences in fuel, I've got to vary that temperature to result back to the same chain link, because those chain links are different based on the fuel. So if it's diesel, it's one thing, jet fuel, kerosene, I get up to um, gasoline, white gas, like the Coleman lantern, that kind of thing, you know, I'm going to drop the temperature way down because it's already refined to some point, right? Way beyond what gas is. So, um, and that's the other cool thing, you know, you can mix your fuels and... <coughs> now I got my vaporizer and I run on my car in the city. I went from 23 to 25 to 30 to 38. And uh, I ran Coleman, gas and fuel, rubbing alcohol, different fuel. Because right. I don't want all the additives left over. So that's not cracking it. But on a right. small test, I actually cracked it on a hot plate. I ran it on a hot plate. Right. So, so when you say you ran the engine off the hot plate, you're, you're sucking the fumes off of the hot plate. Dripping on the hot plate and sucking the fumes. That's what that is. It's a fuel injector spraying directly onto a hot plate. The hot plate's got veins in it that lets the air pass through. Right. And that's the exhaust gas is going through there? The exhaust gas is warm in that plate. Oh, okay. And I've got a, a, a K-type thermocouple to know what the temperature of the unit is. So <coughs> over here on the intake side where I stuck those exhaust fumes through that right. and back into the intake, I can vary so I can maintain temperature here of exactly whatever temperature I say I want. Right. And on my little fixed screen, it'll say, you know, gasoline mix, high, mix, low, whatever I'm going to put in for... Um, so it's basically a with a bunch of sensors on it, or a sensor. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I deleted the EGR off that motor yeah. whenever it was making 530 horse at the wheel. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, damn, I need an EGR on there so yeah. I can do this yeah. with it. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's like no, I want to go back to sock horsepower 
operating, but it's two PS on the data. Yeah. So, so that orifice thing I was talking about before, where, where it'll variable down. Um, I, I was thinking about that, um, and the first design idea I've had that I think is the most viable is to figure out this tune and length, because you can't just have a flat plate in there that sucks down to some amount, because then you get this buffering, chuttering effect that happens, and which could be a good thing for uh, pulses as the intake valves open, and that's a completely different conversation. Um, it's not what you want in this predictable <laughs> environment. So what I'm thinking I might do there is um, tube inside of the tube coming on the right on the way into here, <coughs> and I'll figure out what that length has to be to avoid all that buffeting. But I'll put a tube in here. I don't maybe I'll mature the edges of it just a little bit. Um, you know, 120 degrees out, I'll touch it. So I can keep it in the center of the flow. Keep a tiny cross section as I can without uh, worrying about the uh, thickness of the wall um, fluttering and whatnot in the intake cap. And then have those orifice plates on the outside ends of this guy. So whenever it's opened up, you get your full three inch intake. But whenever you shut it down, it shuts down around and closes up on it too. And now you only have a one inch intake. Because that's kind of my design goal is to say, choke this bastard down where it can't make power. And then all I do is go back to that equation I told you I found out there on the web, plug in the same numbers, say I've got a one inch intake now, and it'll come back and say, oh, 2150 or, you know, 1850. All the RPM, that motor can sustain with this kind of intake, and I'll be like, that's what I want. Oh, right, 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 yeah, 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 the whole variable thing, whenever you do that, that's kind of, I've seen them done, uh, Geek stuff looks like that, actually, they've got that mixing valve business, and they try to put um, variable across the length of the lever, where you plug the lever into that thing to change the ratio of it, yeah. that's heading back to the analog thing, so yeah, screw that, I'm, gonna, yeah. I'm all about some servos and water meters. How are you Yeah, you said it, servo. Servo's a drive. Yeah. Yeah, so <coughs> I'll, I'll come up with this whole assembly right here. This piece of okay. the intake that, that's ahead of I'm just, the vapor box. I'm just not picturing how it. So, so yeah, no problem. So there's my normal three inch intake. Yeah. And then up inside of there, and I won't do the fluted part. So I've seen 120 degrees, so on the other side there'll be another one, there's one on top, right, that's holding that guy. And then there's going to be basically like a flange. So, so when you have a flange pipe, two flange pipes come up, and then they bolt together, right? And if I'm bolting them to drop a gasket in, there's not going to be a gasket. It's going to be this variable guy. Uh, I'm not doing that part with the crap. But, but there'll be this variable thing inside of there, and that's the flanged area. So this three inch intake on this side goes up to the air box, you know, where your um, filter is yeah. coming in. And then you'll hit this guy and he'll be, and so on the outside of this guy, if you ever see these in a the lab, they got tabs on to There's drive the aperture. a bunch of tabs that are going to have a linkage. There'll be, yeah, there'll be tabs with the aperture and then another set of tabs so I can get on the front and back of that guy. Because I don't want this to flutter, yeah. you know, from it being pulled from behind. I want to close it on both ends. That, that's just something I've been bouncing in my head for the last couple of months about working out all the details of that. Yeah, I do have a... Issue. Well, I've got, I recently got a little Bot Mini uh, 3D printer, so I can prototype crap like that yeah. and totally figure it out and try it in a vacuum and watch it blow up. In there. And you can do stuff in there like T-Glaze is a very cool material. Um, it comes out with my like clear acrylic. Um, so part of this I am going to do on purpose in T-Glaze just so that you people can look inside there. Yeah, you can see the projector pulse in, huh? Yeah. Look at this other part. You don't see anything, do you? You know, in behind this guy, just before I hit the throttle plate. That'd be great. I have like a collar in there, you know, so you can see that. Um, T-Glaze, I think to melt it to conform it, it's like 240C. I think yeah. 290C, somewhere up there, is so what you have to do on the printer just to get the flow so that you can print with it. Yeah. So um, I'm sure it'll handle like 200C. Yeah. 
and see stuff performing. And you know, it's, it's a rush of air coming through there. Although that's heating, um, it's surrounded by a cold air path. Yeah. So, so yeah. Right, and, and that's what I'm getting to about, right, that's why I want that to be aluminum. Yeah, so, um, and that's what I'm talking about, having these windows along the way so people can actually look at it and see it. And, yeah. No, any more any more hater action? Yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. So uh, I'm taking it from you know proof of concept. It's on a bubbler, and yeah, it can run on fumes. Duh, we've got over 100 years of documentation. People have been doing this. Nobody's business forever. Um, interesting thing. Whenever I started uh, putting this kind of information out, you know, I started getting random emails from people that I've never known before, right? So, um, do Dude uh, gets a hold of me. I give him my phone number. He calls me. He's like, I live about 40, 45 minutes south of you. I was like, oh. He's like, yeah, I'm liking what you're doing. That's really cool. We did that in um, 73 when the gas molecules were going to race back like, you know, in Well, we ran out of oil the first time. Yeah. Because that's going to happen. There's old wells that start filling back up and they start pumping them again. So they don't understand that, but they're taken. Um, so, yeah. So, um, Okay. So, so, um, well, that's why I'm not interested in the electric car. I had a Volt. I got a Volt in 2012, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to do the hybrid thing. I'm going to do the fumes generator, and I'm going to do XYZ, and I'm going to run an electric car. And yeah, I started tinkering with the fumes. I'm like, I got a 300 horse, 200 mile per gallon car. What do I don't care about electric car. Right off the line, there's still. Yeah, they always want to do arguments with the carbon footprint business and making the batteries really Carbon's good. Carbon's good. That's true. How, how many cars have you modified? The one on the stand and that 78 TA okay. are the ones that I've actually had running, um, except for the 78's burned up now. Smoke was literally rolling out between the head and the block. I think it's done. I'm just guessing. I don't know a lot about this stuff. I expect I'm going to be done. Did you talk to Frank about the annealing uh, the metal with, with, with the hydrogen? Was, uh, yeah, we've talked about it. He was saying it. that they ran a motor without coolant. And it right, right. Yeah, and eight. part of the reason I'm doing this particular motor is I keep calling this car the mule. It's going to be one we test lots of stuff on. This motor, because it's V530 at the wheels before, it's been under a lot of pressure. It, it ran, back in, when, when it ran back soon, it ran the car for five hours one day on the dyno. 530, 530, 530, 530. It was reliable all day long power. I'm like, yeah. You guys did a good job. Thank you very much. I mean, it cost me a lot of money. Um, but that thing's awesome. Um, it's got Jamie Forge pistons, uh, but not even that rise. Um, there's no cheap stuff in that motor. It all trains is wicked. So I'm not worried about burning that motor. Even if I go lean for a minute and a half, you know, I'll be like, oh crap, and dial something down or whatever. Um, this initial version of this kit, yeah, I'm going to have more controls in the car than I'm going to allow for the normal kit. The normal person isn't going to do all of the stuff. Um, you know, my, my original, yeah, my original idea for this was going to be a switch on the dash and a dial. The switch was going to be, do you want to go back to fuel injection because the fumes are screwed up or something weird's happened, and you need to switch back into fuel injection to get home, um, or uh, you're on fumes, everything's cool, and you're watching your own temperatures, and you want to dial some more lean and rich, and you want to bias it yourself some more beyond what it's doing already, because you already know I'm not going to be pulling hills. I'm fixing to be driving across Texas. Straight line forever. Yeah. Um, so you could have a dial in there and do this kind of thing. That was my initial thing. I don't know what the final one's going to be now. I know a lot of people are going to help you make those decisions because more people will get involved. They'll be like, well, yeah, we'll collaborate on this. We'll knock this out in a year. Um, because you can do things like prototype and stuff. you got environments like the sort of farm I was talking about. I can throw resources at this. You know, nobody's business. I need people. You know, people want to say, hey, I know this cool physics program. And we can actually do all these flows and everything. I have a server running on. I'll be like, hold on. Connect to this IP address, please. And they'll be on their own server. Not yourself out that. Did you see the uh, video I have on my website? My friend got his engine back in the uh, 1840s. The intake and the exhaust run together. They're molded together. And it's, a, it's a natural vapor carburetor, and they were not they were not allowed to put it on the road because the miles they, they told them that made that engine it cannot be allowed on the farms. Wow. 
That doesn't surprise me. I'll tell you what that reminded me of. Go farm the highway. I seen a guy. Go farm equipment only. I seen a guy. Allow that on road. He claims he was running this car. H H O on the money. I got a video on my YouTube site. Uh, uh, he's been busy for the last couple of years. We want to part of that baby now. Right. Any deal? Come to South Carolina. There's no inspection. Yeah, no, we don't have inspection. Yeah. Big <laughs> <Take, laughs> rattle and roll down Michigan. Yeah. There's no safety inspection. No emission. So why would they know to go under the hood and start looking? They don't. I have no problem with stuff like this. I mean, that's me, but I would. Um, so, uh, no, this guy in North Carolina uh, had a bumper sticker on the back of his car. This car runs on water, ask me how. State trooper pulled him over. This is a few years ago now. State trooper pulled him over, and he says, uh, is this true? He's like, yeah, you want to know X, Y, Z? He's like, no, I'm not going to you a ticket. And it's because he wasn't paying gasoline tax to for the road, so it would not be on the road without paying taxes on it. Yeah. I was like, you got to be kidding me, dude. There's like some stupid amount of money on the ticket. And it was just a fine. You know, I would just use looking at that. Very neat, you know, they already have. Oh, I mean, that was your story now. Uh, yeah. So yeah. now what you've got to pay the ticket and go to the judge. The judge is going to read them the charges. And says, well, judge, you know, the judge will read them the charges and say, do you understand the charges? Or you ask them, to say, well, no, I really don't. Did you look into the file and determine if probable cause exists for my arrest? Because an administrative hearing is different than a judicial hearing. The judge will look at it and say, it's not there. Now we've got evidence of an arrest without a warrant, and if it goes and files a claim with the county or the agency, it's a slam dunk. That's why we don't go to So, um... Do you know if this car is actually running solely off of? No, I don't. I mean, it's. It wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I mean, you know, I see, I see that unit you've got in there. Um, go the leaders for a minute and the physical size of the box. I'm talking about, I'm talking about the black thing that's on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but I'm talking about the white boxes you've got in here. Yeah. Um, I was looking at that and I was thinking, you know, that car. Because you stretch that car that I'm building to fit that body on it, so it looks like it might be in the outlet. Um, you actually cut, you know, fear of motors in the back um, to the firewalls behind you, and you cut right behind the firewall and you add 11 inches of steel. Um, so it makes a nice bay area. And the first thing I thought of was, hey, <laughs> even if I don't have other ways to make a nice joke, I can run that thing. I can dump the hydrogen in straight off that thing. I mean, there's ways to get it done. You know. Um, that's why that's why I had to try and stay on track with the fumes thing. Um, I was telling them that I wanted a couple of hours, so I was going to speak one hour about the fumes thing and uh, do the question and answer on the fumes thing for about 20 minutes. And then I was planning on 40 minutes of other topics, um, but it's already seven, so it's getting really close to a few or two hours. I'm about to um, you guys don't know if you want me to talk more about these things, but I'll tell you the things I'll talk about tomorrow morning from here. Um, I have had, I've, I've worked for global corporations all of my earlier career um, before I went off on my own. Um, knowing how they do things, and, and some of these corporations are like Caliber, uh, Caliber Brown Root, and I was with them before it was Caliber Brown Root, but nevertheless, like a lot of good things start off for a good reason. They get kind of taken over and other stuff becomes of something that should have been good in the first place. Um, we see that every time we go all the time. Uh, Halliburton is one of those places, actually. Because uh, what was the thing in Iraq where they supposedly lost how many billions of dollars? Really? Okay, sure that happened. But I started with them in 94 when they had Haiti. We kicked Baby Doc out of power in Haiti back then. And we were the cops on the ground. Um, I saw things that went down there. Um, I was in the Balkans when we did the Bosnia deal. I went back to Albania when we did the Kosovo deal, um, and then I left that. Once I was working in IT, 100%, um, my company I was working for got outsourced to EDS, uh, which Ross Perot started back in the day. Uh, they eventually got a part of HP and became an HP employee. But during that time when I was at EDS, I got to leave my account and go to other accounts. One of those was uh, where I had a clearance, and I built networks for the Navy and the Marine Corps. 
um, I can tell you firsthand knowledge about some of the things that Edward Snowden has revealed, and that's why I don't mind talking about it now, because it's cats out of the bag. Um, but as another person, yeah, I knew this guy who actually did this crap. I can talk about this. Um, and, and because of that, I can talk about how can we actually have a private conversation. So there are apps on our cell phones we can actually use anymore that have gotten better to the point that I'd actually suggest them now. They stopped early on. Uh, they were flaky, um, hard to use. They've gotten a lot easier for folks that aren't that tech savvy about how to make a phone call with it, how to text somebody with it. A lot of those issues got cleaned up. Um, so I would suggest those things. And uh, beyond that, I'm building my own encrypted network that I will join people to who want to be on it. And we can share files and make things. Um, why don't you just use the black phone? I have one. What's that? <coughs> Why is it the black phone? Black phone? Black phone. I have one. It's really good secure. Is it the same thing as red phone? Because red phone is the app that runs it's on the regular cell phone. It's from Europe. You can buy it from Oh, okay. It's probably based on the it's same thing. It's more basic Android, but it's really secure. It's, it's probably the same thing. It's because these guys. Google. You can't do anything for it. You can search with Google, but. It won't let you use any of their apps. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Can I interrupt just a second? Yeah, we're good. I was just saying who wanted to hear stuff that we wanted or not. Uh, tomorrow, does anybody need to speak tomorrow?